very much. And, uh, I hope my voice will last the duration. Um, thank you very much for inviting me to come here to speak today. It's a pleasure to talk to a, a group of people which I admire largely uh, for the willingness to participate in this extremely important work. And you guys are really were where the issues hit the, the, the road, hit the road, so to speak. Um, I would like to start by conveying a message that I received last week when I had the privilege of being invited to address the World Congress of Agronomists and Agrologists in um, Quebec City. They had two very esteemed international figures to give the two opening addresses. The one was the independent chairman of FAO, the United Nations Organization for Food and Agriculture. The other one was the direct OECD director of agriculture and uh, trade. So definitely we had two really international heavyweights in the area of agriculture. And what he told the more than 1,000 delegates, and which I would like to convey to you because it certainly bears on what you're doing, both of them independently pointed out that if there was one issue of importance to agriculture and the future of food production in the world, it was water. So it just brings into perspective the importance of the work that, right, that you guys are involved in. And I was certainly pleased myself because I couldn't get better advertising for my talk about uh, water challenges for the next generation of farmers. So with that said, what I will try to do today is uh, I will start with a little bit of a more general discussion about the issue that are uh, facing uh, water managers in the world today about how to share water in an environment where water is limited, in an environment where basins are closed. And following that, I will talk a fair bit about the work that my students at the University of Edmonds have been involved in. We have surveyed more than 2,000 people living in the South Saskatchewan River Basin from Calgary and South, and ask them what kind of policies they would like to see, or what policies they would support to share the water and try to minimize the social economic impact of sharing water in a, in a, a different way. And we are particularly uh, involved in more than 300 farmers across 13 irrigation districts and ask them how they would like to vote in a new plebiscite about sharing the water with other users and what would influence that decision to vote yes or no. And I hope that will be of some interest to you guys because that is kind of some of the issues that you're facing in your work. How do we balance different uh, needs of water? How do we share the water that's available? So that's basically what I will try to achieve today. So first a little bit about the context and the root of the problem. You can say that we are trying to deal with um, throughout mankind, throughout history. Different rulers and governments and kings and others have been allocating water, using water in pursuit of whatever was the policy objective at the time. So water has been used as an economic instrument, so a political tool to try to get people, farmers, to do the thing they wanted to do, to achieve what policymakers wanted to achieve. What characterized that what government wanted to do with water right up to the 1970s basically was expansionary. It was policies to use more water, to extract more water, subsidize development of major irrigation projects and dams, to not let, let any drop go into be wasted out into the ocean. So, and basically my argument is that today the problems that we are trying to overcome today through the dominant bank planning processes one of similar processes is to overcome the consequences of these policies and the success of these policies. Policy makers was extremely successful in maximizing our extraction of water to an extent where we today have to say, hey, oh, we now have an the problem says no more water. And in reality, maybe we should use even less because it starts with problem of water quality and those kind of issues. So my argument is that the problem we have today is a product of the policies of the past. So these are some of the, the things that policies have been directed toward. 
we wanted to allocate resources and encourage resource use in order to increase economic activity, to generate product that we could export, to generate more jobs, to try to convince people to settle in places that are not otherwise appealing, to try to get farmers to settle the areas of Alberta because railway needed this time, so and they built the railway, so they needed somebody to come here and live and produce something the railway could take away. Um, and in many areas we also developed the irrigation project to uh, reward returning soldiers, both in Australia, Western United States, and to some extent also in Canada. Soldiers have returned from the wars. One of the awards, rewards they could get was a piece of irrigated land. So there was all policies that encouraged those who get the resources to use it to the highest extent. As a matter of fact, in, in Canada and elsewhere, if you came here as a farmer from Europe, you've got 300 acres, if you didn't clear it, right, you lost it. In some parts of the world, like in the western US, if you, got, if you appropriated a water right, if you didn't use it, could lose it, could be given somebody else. So there were very strong incentives to intensify the use of natural resources. So that, that's what is changing. You're starting to see maybe that's not the way to continue. Uh, we started to see the environmental impact. We started to see rivers burning in the US. There's some famous pictures from the 70s of some river in Ohio or something that's going up in flame because of pollution. Um, there was major fish kills in a number of rivers. I still remember when I moved to Australia in 1990, and I heard about this mighty river called the Murray River, that's high from Australia. And the pictures we saw on the television was some kind of a slimy green canal that snaked their way down through Australia. And dotted among the slime, the green slime, was the areas fish would belly up. And so that was these kind of things that really caused a change in the public perception about what should we, how should we be using our water. So we started to see these images in television. We actually started to, people started to be more affluent, we had cars, we had more leisure time. We started going in and act, interacting with the environment, enjoying swimming in the water, catching fish, going white water rafting. So there was this slow change of perception of values in the, in the population about how did we think our rivers and our lakes should look in our countryside. So basically society's values started to change. And he did that at the grassroots, and eventually that also flowed through to major international organization, and I've listed a couple of what, in my opinion, is major international milestones in not, I wouldn't say they were driving this shift, they were responding to the shift and further promoting the shift, because policies normally react to uh, broader notions of the, in the community. I have started with a real declaration on gender 21 in 1992, because in a sense, you guys, this is Alberta's response to Agenda 22, 21, sorry, to Agenda 21. So what did Agenda 21 say? In my opinion, that is basically still what we are trying to do. We haven't quite got that yet, right? But these are the objectives of Agenda 22 in 1992. And maybe you will not say, oh, well, I've heard about that before. We are still talking about that, right? How are we going to do that? How are we going to have public participation? How are we going to develop decision making to, to people like yourself? How are we going to meet the legitimate right of the environment? What Agenda 21 said was that the environment has a legitimate right to water. So it should be allocated water just like any other user. We started to shift the, the way of thinking about water from being a social good to being an economic good. He promoted that we should start to price water so everybody should pay the cost of water. We talk a lot about economic instruments and the bird and the water of life strategy, but I haven't heard much talk about water pricing for good reason, I think. That is a very touchy issue. Um, 
the more efficient, the more productive water uses in Agenda 21, and this is definitely in the water flow strategy as one of the pillars. And the use of economic instrument markets to ensure that water is being put to more efficient use. And Agenda 21 promoted what we call integrated water management to integrate balance the interest of economic, social, and environmental interests. So, with a lot of rivers being over allocated or fully allocated in around the world in many basins, the response has been to close the basin. We did that in South Dakota, New York Basin in 2005 and said, sorry, the till is empty, there's no more water being given out. I've done that in most Australian basins, in the United States, in the Monday basins around the world, there is no more water. So along come a development and say, well, I have this fantastic idea generating 2,000 jobs. I'll plant a million acres of, of vineyards and I'll do a lot of money and I'll create jobs. And the government had to say, it's a bloody good idea. We'll go and find some water to do it. We don't have anything. Right, so that increases the pressure to find mechanisms by which we can share the water that is already allocated. So if somebody knew what to use water, they have to go and find somebody that have a license and convince them to give it to them. And they probably won't do it for free. Right? So we have some kind of an exchange between what is perceived to be a willing buyer and a willing seller. <coughs> so that, in my opinion, raises these four issues of which I would particularly talk about the first trade, the first tree. So how do we meet new demand? Somebody come and say, I have this fantastic idea, like putting a potato process on your table or something. I could have here. And the irrigators, of course, was forthcoming to supply that more, but you definitely couldn't get it from the government. And how should we provide more water to the environment if all the water is already allocated? And it's acknowledged that there's not enough water in the rivers. How are we then going to get this water to the environment? And the water life strategy's answer is efficiency and productivity and voluntary sharing of water. And how do we do the socio-economic consequences of that? Well, if a certain user, let's say irrigators, have access to this much water at the moment, and we say, well, if I actually need 20% of that to be back to the river, what would then happen to the irrigation industry? What would happen to Tabor and Raymond and all the other communities that are dependent on that water generating jobs? If you certainly replace an irrigated production with a dry land production, I mean, it's going to cost not just the farmer, but also the community. For jobs, potential people moving away, declining tax revenues in the local municipality, and with all of your wealth. So, that is a real issue here to be considered. So, the first two issues that are listed on the previous slide is basically two different ways of doing it. That's fundamentally, and then there's all kind of middle solution. Um, the government can use draconian measures, as I call it. Uh, which means they can tell user X that, sorry, you might have had the right to use this water for 100 years, but it's not any longer in our best interest, so now we take it away. And here again, we say, no, 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 we have water rights. And I'm absolutely sure they have water rights. But if the political will is there, the laws can be changed. They might afterwards start up and say, well, 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 I have a right, and go to the court and they give an initial conversation. But at the end of the day, if the political will is there, can be done by draconian message. Or we can leave it to the invisible hands of the market, as the economists call it. If we have a willing seller, a willing buyer, and on both things they're going to be more happy after the transaction, then that's a good thing. Apart from the people who might be impacted by the fact that the two people are going to be happy, there might be some other parties that are not going to be happy, and the market can just not resolve that. We can also have a combination of methods, but the planning processes that you're going through and the one that you're going through in Australia and other places, in a sense, you are trying to, to define water conservation objectives that have to be met in the river. The only problem with that in the Alberta context is that that water conservation objective will be given a license with a seniority of 2013 or whatever your plan is going to be passed. And that means if there is not very much water, 
if there's no voluntary action on the part of someone else, then the environment is not going to be that water. In Australia, they've tried the same thing. They actually developed in the early 2000s, they developed water sharing plans in New South Wales and Colorado and other states and other things by groups, exactly like the talking packs. And their first objective was to define how much water the environment needed. And once they've done that, they figured out how are they going to share the water that's left. And that was a lot of hard discussion because the irrigators was at the table, the environmental group was at the table, the government was at the table, everybody was at the table. And some of them actually come up and agreed on solution by irrigators. Some of the irrigators got 40% or more. And then we had a drought in 2006. And the social economic consequences of implementing what was already decided came to the fore, and the plans were suspended. And one politician stood up and mumbled into a telephone something about compensation. And as soon as compensation had transmitted through the microphone out to the listeners, any kind of voluntary sharing and, and that kind of thing, that was down the curtain. So the government then moved to the invisible hand of the market. So the government used taxpayers' money to buy back voluntary from Europeans. And that's not, that's, not, uh, that's not popular either. I'll show you some pictures in a moment. Um, I'll split the second one. The social economic impact, what the social economic impact would be of reducing um, water access for irrigators, say by 40%, uh, will very much depend on what the irrigators are going to do in response. Will they improve efficiency and productivity? If they can improve efficiency and productivity by 40%, then nothing will happen to social production, right? Um, but can they do that? Can they afford it? And how are we going to do that again? Should we rely then on irrigators doing it voluntarily and funding it themselves? Or should we be subsidized? So these are issues that I think is worth a fair bit of thinking and thinking about the consequences. There is another issue about increased productivity and efficiency because if you reduce losses, then somebody's losses is somebody else's gain, right? If an irrigator is really bad and you only have 40% efficiency, so 60% is not used, what happens to that 60%? It ends up in the river. What does it do there? Help the environment and supply somebody downstream. If that irrigator certainly becomes 80% efficient, what happens to the difference between 40% and 80%? It is not in the river, so it's not available for the environment, it's not available for downstream use. So a lot of discussion about this in, in, the, in Australia. And of course, the 10, 11 billion dollars at the moment spending the Australian government is trying to use water for the environment, most of it is used for efficiency and productivity gains. And the irrigation sector nationally is arguing that all the money should be used for irrigation efficiency because then nobody has to be taken out of uh, irrigation. The problem with that is that figure shows that it costs ten to fifteen thousand dollars to save an acre foot of water through efficiency improvements, and it costs about fifteen hundred dollars to buy a bank of irrigators. So, from the taxpayer's perspective, what is the best idea to buy a bank? From the irrigation leadership's perspective. It's far better to improve efficiency. So we have this kind of struggle at the moment. So I'm just telling you this to illustrate that a lot of these issues that are not straightforward and simple. So we are, we are, we are left with these different challenges. So a lot of the people I know in the environmental lobby group, they were saying, well, I don't believe you should buy water back from the because <laughs> He gave it so that the freeze, why should we not buy for it to get it back? So is it, is it right to buy it back? Should we spend taxpayers' money on it? Or should we just tell the irrigators and some other water users, sorry guys, uh, we gave this to you for free and uh, we've not enjoyed it now for 150 years, but sorry the society's values and interest in water have now changed, so as of next year, Mr. Irrigator, I'm very sorry, but there won't be any water anymore, we we'll only get 50%. Is that fair? I don't think the answer is that clear cut. Um, 
somebody else could argue, well, you just go back this hundred and hundred years and look at how the extent to which we are pushed to do this. We didn't do this just voluntarily. We have politicians out there telling us to do it, pushing the water down our throats and saying, grow more crops. We are now spending our families chosen earning for the last 150 years on developing our farm. Have a look about how efficient we are. We have increased our efficiency by 40 or 50 percent over the last 10 years. If you take our water away, all our assets are gone. So these issues are not simple. So if you're talking about letting the invisible hand of the market do the talking, then generally speaking, if you ask people, they are not much in favor of water markets because water is a social good, it belongs to the community, it should not have a monetary value. The irrigators themselves generally don't like it. I'll show you some pictures, some figures from our surveys. Generally, we have not had good experiences of finding solutions to share water in Alberta either. So think about the Balzac transfer, you think about the attempt to uh, emit district licenses, is anybody against these things? Yes, just about everybody is against, right? And, and why is that? Why is it that we seem to not be able to find these solutions? And these political developments in Alberta was what spurred my interest in figuring out why is it actually, what are people actually thinking? Why is it that even something like the Balzac transfer or the the amendment of the licenses to meet city needs is straight out of the water flow strategy. It's, it's um, star solutions, uh, right? But the decisions want, but still we can't seem to get agreement on, this, on these issues. Uh, one of my Australian PhD students sent me this cartoon a couple of months ago. So um, they are in the process of developing the water down based plan. And they have come up with how much more the environment needs, which have been significantly reduced since the last plan. And by the way, they aren't going to take it away, they're going to buy it from willing irrigators. So the, the, the Prime Minister is a lady in red hair, and the other fellow is the, uh, the minister responsible for the oil down based plan. And I like the, the Prime Minister's comment. We must be on the right track. Everybody is equally unhappy. And now they're demonstrating these irrigators. Greens, fishing lobby, South Australian government, New South Wales government, they're all down there arguing against. And the thing is, and you might have experienced that in your own work, whenever we make plans to reduce people's access to water, they are unhappy. If somebody's not unhappy, they're obviously gaining. So, so if everybody is equally unhappy, then we must obviously be close to being in the right spot. <coughs> 